to look into the question of language design, it's useful to uh, think of how human beings evolved. We don't know a great deal about it, but we know some things. So, for example, it's fairly clear from the archaeological record that uh, modern humans, modern homo sapiens, cognitively modern homo sapiens, developed quite recently in evolutionary time, and maybe within the last roughly 100,000 years, which is a flick of an eye. Uh, that's when you get the enormous uh, uh, increase, explosion of uh, indications of uh, creative activity, uh, complex family structures, uh, um, symbolism, and so on. All of this develops roughly in that period. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, there has been no detectable evolution of these capacities in roughly the past 50,000 years. That's the period since our ancestors left Africa, a small number of them, and pretty quickly spread over the world. So all humans are pretty much identical with regard to cognitive capacity, linguistic capacity, and so on. Which means that there's been essentially no detectable evolution. So there's a small window there where something happened. And it's generally assumed by paleoanthropologists, people who study these topics, that it must have been the emergence of language. Because it's hard to imagine any of these basically creative activities without language, and uh, that language does provide the mechanisms for them. So it seems as though the core of human sensibility and uh, 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 creative and cognitive capacity is the development of this completely unique capacity there's nothing analogous to it anywhere in the animal world. Um, there are animal signaling systems, but they're completely different in design and use and uh, just about every dimension. So something strange happened roughly maybe 100,000 years ago, not very long and language emerged in humans. And the question then is, well, what kind of a system is it? Uh, on the surface, languages look very different from one another. So if uh, somebody walks into the room and starts speaking Swahili, I'm not going to understand a word. Though I will recognize that it's a language. Uh, I won't understand it, but I know it's not noise. As soon as you look more deeply, you find that these languages are basically molded to a pretty similar design, maybe an identical design. The large parts of the of what we hear is just the sound, but that's a very superficial part of language. Uh, the core of language is uh, principles that determine uh, actually an infinite array of possible expressions, structured expressions, which have definite meanings. Now, all of that is well beyond what we can just observe by, say, looking at uh, texts. And when a child is learning a language, the child doesn't learn those things. There's no evidence for them, almost no evidence for them. Uh, nobody can teach them. We don't even know what they are. These are just part of our nature. The core principles, so-called syntactic principles, that form expressions and that provide specific interpretations for them, that's apparently just all part of our nature. And then uh, there are various ways of uh, externalizing it in sound or in sign, which is about the same. Uh, but, it, but that's a kind of a superficial manifestation of an internal uniformity. And the really exciting, and it almost has to be this way, if you think about the way the system developed. It apparently developed very suddenly, 
in evolutionary terms, which meant that there were very limited selectional pressures. So it probably was designed as a, a, a computational, it's a, it is a computational system. It's the only explanation for this array of capacities. Computational systems have certain optimal characteristics. Some are more efficient than others. And there's every reason to believe that this developed pretty suddenly as an optimal communication system, essentially following laws of nature, very much the way a snowflake uh, assumes a very complex form, and not because of experience or training, but uh, uh, just because that's the way the laws of physics work. And there's every reason to believe that language is something like this. Now, to try to show it is no trivial matter. You have to try to show that the superficial variety of languages actually reduces to principles of a common character uh, which approach notions of optimal design. And there has been, I think, no notable progress in that uh, uh, process is a long way to go to try to demonstrate it for, uh, but then of course then one wants to go beyond to try to maybe ultimately to discover uh, the neural basis for uh, whatever this unique capacity is. And, uh, it, it, that's a very hard problem to study for humans. So we know a lot about the human visual system because of direct experimentation with uh, cats and monkeys. Uh, we allow ourselves to do direct experimentation, you know, sticking electrodes into the brain and so on, uh, controlled experiments, but uh, we don't do it with humans. Uh, and humans have about the same visual system as cats and monkeys, so we know about the human visual system. But you can't do that for language. There are no analogous systems. Uh, so you can't, no, no much use studying other animals. Uh, we're unique in this respect. And invasive experiments with human beings are, of course, barred. So it's a very complex and intricate matter to try to find clever ways of getting around the barriers to learn something about these topics. And some progress is being made. Uh, I think we can look forward to a, a period when there will be convergence of uh, various modes of inquiry into design of language, uh, neural basis, uh, acquisition, uh, ver possible varieties of language, and so on. That's a crucial task for the future, which in fact uh, is directed to the core of human nature, the core of cognitive human nature. The most intriguing question, I think, is uh, uh, the one that I basically just mentioned. Uh, there's reason to believe that the core of human uh, intellectual nature, cognitive nature, is a computational system which probably has something like the properties of a snowflake. It simply had to develop this way, given biological and physical law and special circumstances. And the most intriguing question is to try to see if that's true and if it is to show that it's true.